Um, good evening, I'm David Levine. I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. My guest tonight is Catherine Eben, who we, I've, I've interviewed her on Zoom, as well as, she, I think she was the last, one of the last people I interviewed in person when you published Bottle of Lies. So tonight we're gonna to discuss her recent article in Vanity Fair about whether the virus was a lab leak. And so I want to first ask you, um, no one is suggesting that it was the deliberate lab leak, correct? Well, you know, there what, is a was whole- it, was it, yeah, Wasn't it no one, No one credible is suggesting that it was a deliberate lab leak. I mean, there are, um, there are conspiracy theorists who are suggesting that it was an intentional bioweapon, um, but you know the the concept of lab leak is not in any way a unitary theory. It's a whole range of possibilities, um, uh, but but they are involved with uh, coronavirus research in Wuhan. Uh, but yes, no one credible is suggesting it was intentional. And they are talking about, you know, so Dr. Anthony Fauci got involved. There's a whole bunch of characters. Dr. Redfield got death threats. Um, he was the head of the CDC at the time. Um, Dr. Fauci was accused of collaborating with the Chinese. Um, there was research in China. So wh what, do we, what do we actually know? What don't we know? And the article is great because she has lots of documents that we got, I, I assume, through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, um, actually, no, I did not use the Freedom of Information Act um, for this story. And, and actually, I, I haven't used it um, a lot throughout the pandemic just because the news cycles have been moving so quickly. I mean, I filed FOIAs, but the documents I've obtained have really come through my own reporting and human sources uh, providing me with documents. Okay. Uh, you, have things, just, you have things in the State Department that have lots of X's and, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I did get a lot of documentation from inside the State Department and as part of the State Department investigation that took place after uh, the pandemic began. So um, what do we know and what don't we know? Uh, let's let's try to narrow that down a little. Maybe maybe let's break it down a little bit. What do you think, David? You want to give me a sort of um, yes. Um, for, for, uh, for anyone who has questions, because someone already does, um, please put them in the Q and A box, and we'll we'll get to them. I first want to talk to Catherine for a little bit. Um, so okay. So why did you? Uh, I mean, you criticized me. Say why'd you? I didn't ask you why'd you write this book, and I said okay. So so why'd you write this article? Um, I wrote it because uh, my editor and I, you know, as the pandemic has become has come more under control uh, under the Biden administration, mm -hmm. uh, my editor and I were sort of just putting our heads together and saying, what, what are some of the big unanswered questions of this pandemic? And of course, the biggest of all is the question of where the where the virus originated. Um, you know, I also took note of the fact that the, the question of its origin had become incredibly heated after the release of the um, WHO um, advisory panel of experts released a report that really didn't satisfy anybody. Um, you know, and that report stated, you know, we think a lab leak is incredibly unlikely. It didn't state why. And that led the director of the World Health Organization himself, Tedros, um, to say, well, for us over here at WHO, all hypotheses remain on the table. So it was clear that the supposed consensus that there had been of a zoonotic mm -hmm. origin, uh, which had been stated early on, was you know, crumbling to pieces. Uh, and it just seemed like a time to go back and, and look at the question. And what I had decided to do early on reporting this is, you know, try to strip away all the conspiracy theories and fanciful conspiratorial claims and try to just look at, you know, what are the 
credible questions around the issue of origin? What are things that really have not yet been put to rest? And what happened to those credible questions inside of the US government, right? What, what was the, was there a debate inside the government? Was there an investigation? What happened? And that's what I set out to recreate basically in my article. Uh, and by doing that, I think I uncover, I managed to excavate a lot of information that had not yet been in the public domain. It was really at the point that I undertook it, it was an untold story. So we talked about there was, you know, there are several Chinese researchers who got ill, mm -hmm. seriously. Um, China has always denied that it was, was a lab leak. Um, but they, they really have not, I mean, I know a who team went there, but they really were not given full access or the access we would have liked. So where did, where did it start thinking, why did people first think it was a lab leak? Right. And what do we know now? And okay. I, know the, I know the Biden administration has the task force, right? Right. So, so when the pandemic began, uh, the National Security Council uh, within the White House um, began an inquiry into its origin. And, and, and I tell the story of that inquiry in the article. Um, and they were immediately struck by the number of voices from within China who immediately concluded it was a lab leak. Um, and it wasn't just social media. So for example, there were these two scientists who were based in Wuhan, who put up an early preprint paper saying, um, well, we looked around the area uh, and we have noted that there are these two laboratories, the Chinese CDC and the Wuhan Institute of Virology, all within you know, a seven mile radius of uh, the Huanan seafood market, which was thought originally to be the origin, the epicenter of the outbreak. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we think uh, it originated from a lab and uh, that there's gonna have to be real restrictions on these research sites in the future. Well, the Chinese authorities immediately took down that paper, but that sort of launched uh, this NSC unit on this inquiry that you know, one thing after another led them to believe that it was possible that it was a lab leak, that they could not take it off the table. For example, in February, the Chinese government, this is February, 2020. So, you know, we're like one month into the outbreak at that point. And the Chinese government announced is that it's going to fast track this law to tighten lab safety um, throughout the country. Right. Well, OK, why do that? Why do that then? Um, you know, and then there were further signs. So they began to learn about um, a military classified from the Chinese side, classified military research that was taking place within the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, and as they dug into that, it looked more and more like uh, like the Institute uh, sort of nicknamed the WIV. It looked more and more like the WIV was not necessarily this sort of transparent hub of international science, but had a kind of dual function. Um, uh, and you know, just to note that um, the WIV has one of the world's largest collection of bat virus, of coronavirus samples. Um, that they have amassed uh, and they kept in a database and the database was taken down uh, in the fall of, 20, of 2019. So, you know, these were the kinds of clues that the government was amassing before even we get to the question of the sick researchers, which we will come to. Okay. Um, have there been viruses caused by lab leaks? Oh, absolutely. Um, and in fact, if you look at the, the four SARS outbreaks since 2002, mm -hmm. uh, there have been four, I should say, 
There have been four SARS outbreaks since 2002, uh, which have been the result of lab escapes. You know, there was famously a la an anthrax lab escape in the Soviet Union in the 70s, which, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Soviets denied until the Soviet Union crumbled and then the truth came out. So there is ample precedent for, you know, a, a lab escape. You couple that with the fact that the WIV was doing a very risky research, uh, a whole lot of it at a low level of security, what's called BSL-2, uh, so biosafety level two lab, as opposed to like the most contained secure lab, which is a BSL-4. Um, you know, and a picture emerged, uh, just a lot of questions, uh, legitimate questions uh, seem to present themselves as to the origin. Now, Donald Trump who was president at the time and was director of CDC. Donald Trump called it the China, the China virus. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't necessarily imply that it was, he said the virus came from China. He didn't necessarily imply that it was a, a leak. Well, he did actually. So ex rather explicitly in April of 2020, okay. and I should add that April of 2020 was really before the government had amassed uh, its most compelling evidence about this. Um, he was in response to a question at a press briefing, he said, you know, we have very strong evidence that it came from a lab. Um, okay. And but he didn't. Well, it, it doesn't appear that he had this, he certainly didn't have the evidence that we have now, that the government has now. Um, uh, you know, I can't say for sure what he had or didn't have, but I know that some of the most compelling evidence for the lab leak theory came months later. Um, but the problem was that that statement, you know, from somebody who had been you know, publicly beating China and calling it Kung flu and being very destructive and racist uh, about it, created this kind of, uh, I quote a source in the story saying it created a kind of antibody response within the federal government, which is, you know, nobody wanted to be feeding a xenophobic agenda uh, and possibly conspiracy theories and contributing to violence against you know Asian Americans. So there was a huge resistance to that statement. And actually, ironically, that resistance made it much harder to have a effective uh, investigation. So let's say if the lab leak came from the United States, would we be admitting it as freely as we should? Well, you know, I can't answer what we would have done, but I mean, I think one can imagine a situation in a democratic country that it has more uh, tradition of transparency uh, and you know, global pressure and an admission, an, an investigation and an admission or acknowledgement. So part of the problem is that China has been uh, utterly untransparent uh, about all of this. Uh, now, we don't know whether they've been untransparent, I don't know if that's a word, huh? untransparent because that's what authoritarian governments do, they just lie about a whole lot of stuff, uh, or is it because they're concealing a lab leak and we don't know? Mm -hmm. So what, what do we gain from the knowledge of that it's, it was a lab leak, that we need to, our labs need to be more secure, Better. I mean, you see, in the bottle of lies, you talked about how, you know, the FDA doesn't have the authority to go to into a foreign country unannounced, right. and that they go in these places and they clean up and they and there's and the, you know, all the stuff in the closet, you know, that we they don't want us to see. Mm -hmm. So, how do we prevent? So, re, until until well, I know the Biden administration can issue a report, which probably won't be conclusive because they're not having cooperation with China. Mm -hmm. But how, what should we be doing to eliminate the, the lab leaks in the future if there was one? And how would that, 
how would that have changed? Um, let's let's say that China said yes, it was elaborate. Mm -hmm. How would that have changed the course of the virus? You know, it's not. I don't know that it would have changed the course of this virus, okay. but it could absolutely transform how we do research going forward. You know, I mean, what is kind of alarming when you dig into it is that many of these research laboratories are really under-regulated or unregulated. You know, there were State Department cables that were sent back in 2018 from, from Wuhan to the US, uh, which said, um, uh, hey, they're opening up this BSL-4 lab in, in Wuhan and uh, they're understaffed and they don't have the right protocols and they need help. Uh, and it seems like super really dangerous because they're working with uh, dangerous pathogens, you know? And then once you start digging into the research, you see, whoa, you know, there's really poor enforcement, poor budgeting, um, you know, poor training, uh, overcrowding in a lot of these laboratories. Like if you look at the, the SARS lab escape, I think it was 2013 in Beijing, <laughs> where there was, you know, a live SARS virus that was um, moved to a fridge in the hallway because of overcrowding. And some researcher was like, assumed that it was deactivated and took it out and sparked an outbreak. So there's, you know, uh, it could have an absolutely transformative effect on how these labs are regulated. Um, <clears throat> and also, you know, what kind of research is pursued in the field of virology? Because there's a huge debate around that as well. Okay. Um, so how do you, how are you able to get people to give you these, you know, wonderful documents? And also you, you also, you, you spoke to people in China too. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, and I, I was, should say I don't speak uh, Mandarin, but Vanity Fair um, allowed me to, to uh, hire a, a Mandarin speaking science journalist named Lily Pike, who was terrific. Uh, and so um, she did our, you know, Chinese translations and calling for comment in China and, and whatnot. Um, well, let me just say, you know, without identifying sources, um, there was a, once I dug into what the US government was investigating when, there was a huge battle over this within the State Department. So there was um, a group of, of uh, officials who were uh, who had been investigating, you know, violations of bio warfare treaties, and from that perspective, they began investigating the COVID origin, um, and began obtaining a combination of <clears throat> open source material and some classified material, um, and basically uncovered that there were these three sick researchers earlier than the known outbreak, the start of the pandemic. And those researchers went to the hospital um, with COVID-like symptoms. They don't know it was COVID, it could have been the flu, it was flu season, um, but they knew that these were, as one source told me, this, these were not the janitors, you know? These were, these were researchers who were working on um, coronavirus, who were working with bat strains. Um, and uh, the other, th and as part of that inquiry, they began digging into the kind of research that was happening at the WIV. And part of that research was called gain of function research, where essentially in a laboratory, as you study infectious pathogens, you manipulate them in such a way to see if they can or might become more infectious to humans. Um, so, you know, part of the research they were doing is creating novel viruses that would take, you know, some element of one strain and an element of another strain and put them together to create a chimeric virus that is even more infectious. Um, uh, but as they, you know, were engaged in this investigation, 
they encountered a lot of resistance from another group of officials in the State Department. And that group of officials basically said, don't dig, don't open a Pandora's box. Don't dig into this. Don't open this can of worms. Uh, so what was that can of worms? The can of worms was the question of gain of function research and the fact that the US government had been funding that kind of research heavily for a long time, um, partly as a response to the SARS outbreak of 2002. So in fact, um, NIH grant money had flown, uh, had, excuse me, had flowed um, to an organization called EcoHealth Alliance, who in turn gave it as a subgrant, some of it as a subgrant to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, so, you know, the can of worms was potentially uh, the US government's involvement, not necessarily in, you know, creating an outbreak or a, you know, super pathogen, but simply in um, providing funds for re controversial research at the WIV. So there was a famous exchange, I believe, between Rand Paul and Dr. Fauci about yeah. this. Yeah. And what was Rand Paul trying to say to Dr. Fauci that we we're funding, uh, you know, we we're, we're funding Wuhan uh, labs, right? So I mean, it has been a, um, a right-wing talking point, um, mm -hmm. which is not accurate. I should say that somehow the US government was directly giving money to the Wuhan Institute of Virology to do this dubious research. So that's not true. Um, what is true is that uh, the US government, NIH, was giving money to this intermediary US group that was in turn giving it to the <clears throat> Wuhan Institute of Virology to do this risky research. You know, um, the question is what, you know, one question is, well, okay, what did we get out of that research? Because that research was, the whole point of that research is to try to help us prevent a future pandemic, right? To flag, flag dangerous pathogens, find them in the wild, flag these dangerous pathogens as a way of creating a strategy of prevention. Um, the critics of that research say, you're going into these remote areas, you're collecting these perilous samples, you're bringing them back to a laboratory in a crowded urban area, right? And then you are trying to make these pathogens more infectious. Um, so the critics view this as incredibly hazardous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, you know, I can't say what was in Rand Paul's mind at that time, uh, but you know, he was basically trying to sort of lay this at the feet of Dr. Fauci in that exchange. So what do we have to gain by, you know, okay, so if it is a lab leak, uh -huh. how does that help anyone? What, what are they, what are the, what are the, does it just embolden the critics of China, saying that China is a terrible place and all, you know, all that kind of stuff? And what does it mean if just, if just originated from China? Could well, I mean, here's the thing. So, the FAA, for example, investigates every single plane crash, right? right? Every single helicopter downing. I mean, they investigate everything. Why? Because it's part of a continuous lessons learned evaluation to try to make air travel safer. So, mm -hmm. you know, when a plane crashes, you don't say, oh, well, that's a bummer and hope that doesn't happen again. You know, <laughs> you find out why it happened, right? Which is why those Boeing jets were taken down uh, from, from flight. So it is critical to find out how this happened, um, it, you know, in order to inform a response to these pathogens going forward, right? So if we find out that it is a completely zoonotic origin and it originated in nature, um, then we're going to be evaluating, uh, you know, our interaction with wildlife, our incursions into natural spaces, you know, uh, maybe we ban the wildlife trade, which, you know, would be wonderful for lovers of, of nature, and I'm one of them. Um, um, but if it turns out that it was the result of some sort of lab leak, you have an entirely different set of responses. And you can't make those decisions unless you know where it originated. 
So what should the United States have done, you know, under the Trump administration and you know, continuing to the Biden? What should, what should, what should we have done? So, because obviously the approach that we took was was not what did not really right. yield us anything. Right. So we needed a comprehensive, global forensic investigation of the origin from the beginning. Now, right. how do you do that? Well, you know, China wasn't letting people in. We know that you know I interviewed Dr. Redfield for my story. He had tried repeatedly to get a team of experts into China. He was denied. Um, but that said, you know, there are a lot of other things. I mean, you know, the U.S. government sits on a vast mountain of intelligence, uh, and there's a lot of information they have, um, which could have, you know, in cooperation and collaboration with allies, um, that could have shed light on this. And obviously. The sooner you're doing a comprehensive investigation, the better, because you know, as people I interviewed explained, biological signals degrade. Um, you know, evidence evaporates, documents get destroyed. Um, so speed is of the essence, right? But 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 part of the story that I uncovered is the way in which um, this was sort of. It, the way in which it was branded as a, a bad faith uh, collaboration with conspirators to even raise the question of a lab leak, right? That that was some branded as um, a, a sort of dark trafficking in conspiracies um, to, to raise that question and nobody was able, allowed to, nobody credible was allowed to bring it up. Is well, basically I want to give, go back to your analogy of the FAA investigating yeah. airplane crashes. The FAA doesn't investigate airplane crashes of foreign airlines, right? Right, that's right. And I know that you know, um, you know, uh, you know, we're very forthcoming with the, with the space program when there's a rocket. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you know NASA has said that the Russians have had many, you know, you know botch landings, failures, deaths, mm -hmm. they don't report it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I don't know how much we would welcome Chinese researchers. Let's, let's say, the lab, you know, they said, I think, well, you know, your labs are leaking. Would we, would we welcome Chinese researchers in the United States to come to inspect our labs? Because we're already limiting Chinese researchers because right. we're, we're, we suspect that they're foreign agents. Right. I mean, you know, this is so that that is a whole question, you know, uh, unlikely we would have just thrown open the doors and say, you know, here, here's the, uh, you know, lab notebooks from the BSL-4 lab in Galveston, Texas. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other hand, this is why you have sort of international mechanisms for investigation and accountability. Um, I think ultimately had, you know, had there been a suspicion that it had originated in the U.S., uh, I, I have to imagine that under public pressure, the U.S. would have permitted some kind of real inquiry um, and been engaged in one themselves, you know, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just engaged in a cover-up. Okay, so again, if you have there are two questions, and I'll read them. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box because um, this is a particip participatory participation thing, um, thing. I like people in the audience to ask questions. So I have a question. Would it be a good idea to avoid the use of the term conspiracy theory entirely since we don't actually know what happened and all possibilities should be on the table? Um, well, first of all, I agree that um, all possibilities, all hypotheses should be on the table. Um, but, you know, it is clear that there have been individuals with um, self-serving uh, agendas who have propagated theories, have made claims without any evidence at all mm -hmm. about the origin of this. So, for example, um, uh, Steve Bannon. Uh, Trump's former advisor had hooked up with this Hong Kong billionaire 
and they, uh, you know, put forward a scientist who made claims that it was a bioweapon, uh, but without evidence and without real information. So, um, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, had it sort of stoked the sort of flames of this on social media, had made claims that it was a bioweapon that was released at the, you know, Wuhan military games to infect US athletes. So I think, you know, when you have individuals who are sort of committed to uh, making wild claims and, you know, trying to spread them on the internet for their own purposes, I think that is a conspiracy, but that's very different from people who are saying, we don't actually know the origin. There are these legitimate questions that can be asked about the origin. Uh, and those, you know, and, and on the basis of that, we should not take uh, the question of a lab leak off the table. What is the Biden administration's, they said within two weeks, no, so they have, they've done, they're engaged, they're sort of in the middle of a 90 day review okay. of the intelligence. Um, and um, the Biden administration came forward and said, there's these two intelligence agencies or two groups uh, of, within the government who believe it was a natural origin and um, another group that is leaning towards the lab leak theory. And he's asked the intelligence agencies to look more closely and do a review uh, of what they have and sort of come back to him within 90 days with some sort of analysis. Who are the two that believe that it's natural and who are the uh, That has not been made public. And we so we don't know that, but what's clear is that there is a divide within the intelligence agencies over what the origin is. So tell me about that, you know, you, in your article, you highlight the Lancet paper which said it was definitely not a lab leak. And right, so this is interesting. So it wasn't a paper, it was a statement. Right. Um, and it was put out in February of 2020 uh, so really at the start of the pandemic by 27 scientists who basically said um, anybody who claims it was a lab origin um, is trafficking in conspiracy theories. Um, it is, you know, the overwhelming view of the scientific community that it was zoonotic origin. And uh, we stand with our, um, our fellow scientists in China against these conspiracies. Um, and then they stated that they had no conflicts of interest and they signed this statement. Well, it turned out, um, it is now turned out that behind the scenes, the person who organized that statement was the head of EcoHealth Alliance, uh, Peter Daszak, who was receiving this grant money from the US government and giving it in turn to the Wuhan Institute of Virology for research and basically had built, um, you know, sort of a multi-million dollar pool of grant money uh, and a sort of professional identity around these, that collaboration with the WIV and with other far-flung laboratories. So uh, he obviously did have um, conflicts of interest. You know, he had a, um, a horse in the race. Uh, so that has since come out, you know, that, that he was orchestrating this statement. Uh, a number of the signatories on that letter uh, either worked for Daszak or collaborated with the Wuhan Institute of Virology or got that grant money. Um, so in fact, it, you know, it wasn't such a neutral exercise after all, but, but that statement had a very chilling effect. Um, it, it gained a lot of traction in the scientific world uh, and it sort of shut down debate around this question for some time. Um, but it also did something else which was interesting which is there were a lot of people, a lot of scientists who looked at that statement and they wondered why, why are the scientists being so unscientific? 
why are they making this claim that it was definitely a zoonotic origin when they in fact don't know? You know, there's no host animal that's been found. There's no intermediate animal. Um, the Chinese government has tested 80,000 samples of animals and wildlife and haven't been able to find some uh, origin for this. So in fact, you know, there, we don't know where it came from. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what, what's gonna happen, you know, so the Bino issue report, are we working with other, you other countries? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure we are. Yeah, I'm sure we are. I'm sure there is, you know, collaboration among governments. Yes. Okay. And um, what if we discover that it was not a lab leak? How does that change things? Um, you know, I think if we discover it's not a lab leak, then there's a, just a different set of questions to ask about how to prevent this in the future. Um, you know, I mean, was it our incursions into wild spaces? You know, was it these bat caves in Yunnan province in Southern China, which is where, um, uh, you know, the, the bat origin for SARS-CoV-1 is believed to have come from. Um, so I think it just, you know, it just presents an entirely different set of questions um, as to how to prevent this in the future. I remember my son once said, I don't ever want to go to China. Every virus comes from there. <laughs> and I said, thank you. And um, I can understand that. Um, there is a question, is there any credible evidence pointing to the People's Liberation Army involvement with the Wuhan lab with COVID-19 was produced as a possible PLA bioweapon? And basically there isn't, there isn't any, correct? Well, um, the answer to that is a little more complicated. So. Um, January 15th, 2021, the U.S. State Department put out a, a statement which was vetted by the intelligence agencies, um, which said, we know that there is um, Chinese military research taking place inside the WIV. Um, and my sources from inside the investigation say, these military researchers are sharing the same space, literally the same laboratory space with these civilian researchers. Um, so that raises the question of whether they were engaged in what's called dual use research. You know, you're doing research uh, to prevent uh, infections and maybe you're doing research to create them. Um, but that, you know, so, so, and that State Department statement has not been walked back by the Biden administration. Um, it, it is sort of still stands as believing to be factual. Um, however, that doesn't mean that SARS-CoV-2 was therefore some kind of bioweapon that originated from the lab, right? So, but we do know that there was, is believed to have been military research taking place there. So I have a question from, um... Dr. John Moore, who has been a guest on my show several times, so Wild Cornell, he said, very impressive discussion. Thank you, Dr. Moore. I read an interview with an Australian virologist who worked at WIV and is very mm -hmm. impressed with the high professional standards there. Did you see this? I did see that. Um, so there's a distinction to be made here. I believe that that virologist was talking about um, her research in the BSL-4 lab. Um, which is, you know, the highest containment laboratory. One of the questions that came up a lot in my research is what was happening in the BSL-2 laboratories. And Shi Zheng Li herself, who is the lead coronavirus researcher at the WIV, right. has acknowledged that they were working with live SARS-like viruses in the BSL-2 lab. And, you know, there has been reporting around that now with people saying, you know, if they were doing that, that is crazy. That is really dangerous. Um, so uh, I think, I think the, the, the question of the um, high standards of the BSL-4 lab could be somewhat of a red herring to this discussion. Okay, another question from Dr. Moore. And what's the end game? If the lab leak is proven, 
Do we go into a global trade war that triggers an economic meltdown or World War III? The Chinese won't accept any Western verdict or punishment. Yeah, look, if it is a lab leak, it is, it is not uh, exactly an easy scenario uh, geopolitically, for sure. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. That, that doesn't mean that we don't need to know where it originated and how it originated. And I would say that, you know, with 4 million people dead around the globe, uh, I think we owe it to all those people to figure out where it came from. Another question. Um, please put it in the Q&A box this in the chat. How could a lab leak theory possibly explain the fact that the virus originated as two lineages? One lineage at the Hunan market, lineage B, and one in a different market, lineage A. This seems to me the result of much more likely possibility that there were repeat spillovers from nature. You know, here, here you get into the the territory of warring virologists, you know, and there are now scientists on both sides of this debate who have looked at the evidence that is in the public domain and claim that it supports one theory or another, or that it's really not clear at all. I just don't think that from the information that is currently in the public domain that either hypothesis could be put to rest. Okay. Is there any reason to believe that the scientific community itself is biased against the lab leak theory because the theory implies that scientific research can do more harm than good? Absolutely. I think this is absolutely true. I mean, in my reporting, there was no question to me that uh, scientists rushed to denounce the lab leak idea um, in part because it would have major implications in their field, you know, uh, as as one source said, it's like the impact of Chernobyl on the field of nuclear research, right? I mean, it, you, you know, what, what would follow if it was a lab leak? You know, moratoriums, research restrictions, uh, I think it could have a devastating consequence on the field of virology. So I do think that there is a lot at stake. And I think that some scientists have, have responded accordingly uh, to rush to take the lab leak hypothesis off the table. So another question, one of the very odd features of the debate is that a number of well-known science journalists uh, have taken strong stands against the lab leak theory. Mm -hmm. One of these said is a racist hypothesis. Any thoughts on whether this is the proper role of journalism, whether there is so little firm evidence as opposed to climate change or evolution, where it is settled science. Okay. I don't know who the journalists are who are saying. Well, that. I, I do because some of them have attacked me. Okay. Um, um, you can name yeah. names. It's all right. I, probably no, I don't need to name names, but you know, I look. My view of this: this is a huge global story, and. Um, it requires a lot of different journalistic approaches, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I am not just a science journalist, I'm an investigative journalist and I approach my reporting and my stories very differently. So for me, it's not just, what do the experts say? Ah, here's the uh, expertise, you know? Um, it's, you know, I, I get documents. I try to go back to, I look at money. I look at conflicts of interest. You know, I look at, um, you know, what is motivating people to behave in certain ways. Uh, so I think that a lot of journalistic approaches um, uh, are, are essential here, you know, for new thinking and new approaches and new sources. So let me ask, you know, basic question because the lead of the news every night is that the Delta variant a couple of weeks ago was 5% of the case in the United States. Now mm -hmm. it's 95%, it's 94%. So, um, so lab leaks would have, have serious consequences. I mean, pandemics have serious consequences. Um, the debate, I mean, do you think part of the you know, like the debate over whether it's a lab leak or not is similar to the debate over whether vaccines are a conspiracy or, you know, or that, 
you know, I don't want to get vaccinated because I don't trust it. I don't trust the government. Is this, is this part of it that we don't trust governments anymore? You know, look, I mean, we're living in an era where there is just, there's a war on truth and it's hard to know what the truth is. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, um, platforms that allow people to claim truth and spread uh, untruths. So it's very complicated and, and confusing. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that we can't sort of disentangle. I mean, my whole reporting effort in this story was to try to disentangle conspiratorial claims from actual facts. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons that I went, chose to go back to the US government's own investigation and say, what did they know when? What happened to the legitimate questions within the government? You know, and try to get away from these claims and counterclaims. Uh, you know, but it, when you have an environment in which everything is politicized, yeah, the, you know, you have certain forces that are appropriating the, the origin question, the vaccine question. Uh, it's terribly unfortunate, but that should not necessarily change what the job of journalists is. Okay. So someone, so Dr. Moore says, I, I agree with you. I want to know the answer to the origin question is going to may trigger a really bad outcome. Uh, you actually answered this question. Can the virus be manufactured in the lab be more pathogenic? And if so, do scientists know exactly when to manipulate the virus to make it pathogenic? Right. Uh, yes. So the answer is it can be. And here too is a dispute among warring vi virologists. So uh, Nicholas Wade, who is a you know former New York Times science writer, right. uh, put out a long post on Medium. Uh, it came out maybe about three weeks before my story did. Um, really looking at these scientific questions. And he quoted David Baltimore, preeminent scientist, saying that he looked at the furin cleavage site, you know, which is part of the sequence of SARS-CoV-2, um, and said that it looked to him like that was a smoking gun because that is where you would have genetic manipulation to make the virus more infectious. But there are other scientists who look at the same sequence and say, actually, you know, the, se the sequence is not optimized for being 100% infectious to humans. And that if you were setting out to create it in a lab and optimize it for transmissibility, you would sequence it differently. So, you know, but again, the lab leak theory is not necessarily that it was optimized in a lab to make it as infectious as possible. The lab leak theory could be a researcher from the WIV went into a bat, you know, an abandoned mine shaft in Yunnan province, took back a sample, didn't know what was in that sample, and you know, took it back to do basic research and had an accident and it escaped that way. And escape in this case, let's remember, is just aerosol transmission. It's not, you know, gushing through a pipe. It's floating through the air. So no, it's not like those movies, Outbreak or Stephen Sondheim, right. where they find the monkey, you know, and all these things. Right. And, so uh, it so it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a lab leak doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it that it was manipulated. Right. So um, my friend Miriam Tucker wants to know how likely is it that we'll actually get a definitive answer about this. I, I have asked myself that so many times. Uh, really good, yeah. And sometimes I think we'll never know. Uh, but sometimes sometimes I think, well, you know, I mean, the political winds will shift and and we will eventually know. I'm just not sure. Okay. So this is, a, this is a, you know, science writers in New York. So how long did it take you to write this story? And was it frustrating because you weren't getting cooperation or well, how, how helpful were people? I know some people were very helpful, but I imagine some people were not. Yeah, I mean, it took about three months okay. uh, front to back to report and write this story. And that is sort of working flat out around the clock. Um, uh, and I think the reporting challenge with this story was sort of 
looking at every kind of twist and turn of things that had interested people and, uh, you know, uh, suspicion, looking at every clue and seeing which had merit, which had real merit, and which didn't. And so in order to do that, that meant reporting everything down to the ground, you know, down to the absolute ground. So for example, the, this case in 2012, in which these six miners were sent to this abandoned mine shaft in um, Yunnan province and told to shovel bat guano out of the, the mine shaft, they became gravely ill, three of them died, uh, and this case was never publicized widely, but then a, one of these interested researchers had dug up a Chinese master's thesis, which described in detail the illness these miners suffered and raised the question of whether this strain, um, which was sort of identified through this case, uh, was a possible precursor to SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, you know, the Mojang, the question of the Mojang mine was something I spent a lot of time digging into. So here's a question. There's a new preprint paper released ahead of peer review out today that concludes zoonotic spillovers are likely explanation for the origins of the coronavirus. If you look in the chat, it says covered here in Bloomberg. But when I clicked on the link, it said it's not valid. So I don't know if you know about this article. There I don't. Are, there are two articles in Nature about this, but um, I know I don't know, know about that. Okay. And okay, so here's a very okay. So can, can you go to the chat and just look at this question from the anonymous mm -hmm. today, rather than reading reading it and just see what you think? Sure. There's uh, a large evolutionary gap. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. So we have a um, <laughs> okay. okay, so first of all, um, it says, um, all staff in the laboratory of Dr. Shi Zheng Li have tested negative for antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. I, I don't believe we actually know that to be true. Uh, I know it's been claimed. But the problem is uh, the medical records of all of the researchers in Shi Zheng Li's laboratory have never been disclosed. And who is, uh, just, just refresh your memory, who she is? Yes, yeah, Shi Zheng Li is the main coronavirus researcher at the WIB. So right. what, there, what there has been is kind of honor system claims about what's happened in her laboratory, but there has been no forensic analysis and there have been no records provided. So I don't know, in fact, that that is at all true. Um, yes, there is an extremely large evolutionary gap between SARS-CoV-2 and RATG13. However, we don't know what the entire world of samples was at the WIV because they took down the database that contained them. So again, you know, uh, yeah, there are a lot of claims about why, um, uh, you know, her lab is in the clear, but I don't think that they have been actually validated through any kind of forensic data, is my answer to the, that, key, that question. Okay. And someone wrote, maybe engineering an optimized sequence would in fact be a dead giveaway. Uh, yeah, that's true too. So you could argue they, you know, I mean, you could argue they didn't want to do that if they were actually trying to orchestrate uh, orchestrate that. Uh, okay, hold on. Somebody is putting in the link to uh, okay, so this came out today. I haven't seen this. Thank you for putting that in. I will take a look at that. Okay. No, yeah. I'm seeing it. As we all know, we can't keep up with everything. And yeah. also preprints are not peer reviewed. Right. So anyhow, so what are you working on now? <laughs> um, I have a couple of different articles in the works, um, you know, including um, a follow-up to my to my lab leak story. Yeah, that's good. So I hope we're going to take some time off and relax after this. Um, 
Yeah, no, I, I did take a little bit of time off after that story. It is it is um, hard to put together an 11,000 word story in three months. So yeah, I needed a, a little break after that. Okay. And before we went on air, we were talking about the Delta variant and how concerned are you now that, you know, it went from 5% of all new cases like a month ago and then 10% and 15%. I am extremely concerned about the Delta variant. And, you know, the more we hear about breakthrough cases, um, I, I am extremely concerned. Um, you know, I'm, as a parent, I'll say I'm, I'm looking at this spread of the variant and thinking, well, it's just in time for them to close schools again uh, in the fall. Uh, so, you know, I still wear a mask when I walk into uh, a store a group, amid a group of people outdoors, I'm still taking precautions. I don't feel, you know, obviously I'm vaccinated, but I don't feel like, uh, I don't really feel like this pandemic is over. No, I feel kind of cheap. I've been very, very good. And now, <laughs> and now before I got to really do much, mm -hmm. I did play tennis indoors today because it was rain and air conditioning, but um, that's about all. Um, all right, so uh, thank you for the preprint. Um, so I hopefully you'll stay in touch with us and maybe you'll come Absolutely. on again and do another article. And Absolutely. And why don't you talk about a little bit about your book, Bottle of Lies, so, because people don't know that. Sure, so, um, so my book came out in May of 2019 and it was an investigation into the quality of generic drugs, uh, many of which are made overseas. And basically what I uncovered is extensive data fraud inside the generic drug industry um, in order to gain regulatory approvals. So um, I spent a lot of time investigating manufacturing practices in India and China. Uh, and I have to say, you know, that that reporting has informed how I how I looked at some of this, the question of a lab leak, because there were a lot of, to my eye, very credulous statements being made about, well, you know, we know that all the laboratories in China operate, you know, with all the same regulatory safeguards, et cetera, as they do in the U.S. And, you know, from my time in reporting in China on how manufa pharmaceutical manufacturing plants operate, uh, I, I am very skeptical of those claims. So... And what do you think about the vaccines that are made? Are you worried that um, some of them may not be up to snuff at some point? Absolutely. Okay. Which ones? Um, well, you know, I mean, first of all, let me just say that the, the Chinese and Russian COVID vaccines, um, that data, I mean, those, that data has not been fully shared. Um, so I am really skeptical of the quality of, of those vaccines. Um, you know, I think, you know, I feel a lot of confidence in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Obviously I have, you know, probably the anxieties around the um, AstraZeneca and J&J &J vaccines that a number of people do. Um, but, you know, I still feel relative confidence and I, you know, I've gotten my kids vaccinated as soon as they were eligible. Um, so I am, you know, despite my concerns about dangerous manufacturing, I am, I am no anti-vaxxer, that's for sure. Okay, so why don't we end on that note and uh, it's eight o'clock and thank you for taking time to spend an hour uh, thank you. with us. And as always, it's the third time and hopefully the next time, maybe it'll be even be in person. Okay, thanks, David. Right. Nice to chat with you as always. Thank thanks you. everybody for joining us, appreciate Please, it. Um, on Tuesday, we're gonna be discussing tuberculosis, which kills over a million people a year still. And the World Health Organization has a goal of wiping it out by, I believe, 2030. But the coronavirus has kind of halted the research, halted the progress. And um, so we'll be discussing that with um, some people, you know, some, some prominent scientists and also a person who has a, a better test for tuberculosis because the ones we have now, you know, goes underneath the kids, children's skin. And nobody likes it, not, not always that accurate. So hopefully you can tune in on Tuesday at seven. And again,
Catherine, thank you so much for spending time with us and stay safe. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.